Hey everybody, Final Thoughts time for Deep Blue, and I gotta say, I was so excited to give this game a go when I first heard about it, because it's from Publisher Days of Wonder, and they only put out one or two games a year, and they are very well known for their very, very high production values. I mean, they put all of their love and attention into crafting this one perfect gem, and more often than not, they succeed. They put out wonderful game after game after game, although, as a general rule, they kind of tend a little bit on the lighter side, more towards family gateway style gaming than I generally care for, but I've always been impressed by their designs, by the presentation, by the pieces, and Deep Blue delivers every step of the way. The art is gorgeous. I mean, we didn't have to have these awesome little minis for our ships. Uh, the insert, if you care about such things, is brilliantly designed. And, I mean, it's just got to put a smile on your face as you're getting the treasures to be able to lock them away in your own little chest that actually stays snapped shut. Oh, and it just feels good as it gets fuller and fuller over the course of the game. I love everything about the presentation. That said, before we get on to the design, because I got to come back to that, um, there is one really big glaring flaw with the production. And I have to admit, I am shocked. I do not expect this from Days of Wonder, but it is something you got to know going in. Gold and silver, it is very, very difficult, um, even in bright light, to tell them apart. Surely, if there's just one, you have no idea what that is. It's not until you keep drawing and you see, oh, yeah, I guess. Uh, that's gold. Maybe it's silver. I was, I mean, they are way, way, way too close. And it's actually, it all depends on what side they're on. Because, like, the silver especially is sometimes darker and sometimes lighter. The gold is sometimes darker and lighter. And you often just can't tell which is which. Uh, you can see from the iconography, it was clearly assumed that the gold was going to be very, very gold. Uh, the silver is pretty silver, but the gold is kind of tarnished. You know, the, these gold icons, and that was really annoying. There were many, many times, as Jen and I have played the game a few times now, we're like, is that gold or silver? Because I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to play my bonus card for, you know, pulling gold up or whatever. No good reason for that. I mean, I do think it's something that players will ultimately decide, hey, you know what, we need to get some gold nail polish or something and, um, you know, dip these gold nuggets in there because, for my taste, they are way, way similar. I mean, other people might disagree. Uh, I'll be definitely interested as, as more and more people get their hands on this to hear. Maybe it was just Jens and me. I mean, hey, I'm 50. I'll be the first to admit, my eyesight is starting to go, but... I don't know. Uh, you'll have to be the judge on that. Maybe it was just us. Or maybe it's our pre-production copy. I don't know. So anyway, I ran into that. Uh, but again, otherwise, everything about this presentation is phenomenal, as you would expect from Days of Wonder. But anyway, Days of Wonder was only half the reason I was excited. More importantly, the design team of Daniel Peterson and uh, Oscar Granerud uh, these two guys, uh, previous this year, they gave us the excellent Tetrisy uh, Copenhagen, which is one of the, you know, maybe uh, just about as close to per, uh, Tetris board game perfection as anybody's ever done. One of the best polyomino games uh, that's come out. Uh, Copenhagen is amazing. And then you go back a little bit further, these guys teamed up on A Tale of Pirates, which was a real-time worker placement game that was phenomenal. Totally knocked it out of the park. I think it just missed my top 10 of that year. It was so fantastic. And then on top of that, I mean, I know uh, Daniel's done some other stuff, but Oscar, his other big game is Flamme Rouge, which is a very hugely, highly respected um, uh, bicycle racing game. Um, that may not, it, it's much more interesting than it sounds. A, a really, really good, good game. So these guys, they are definitely making a name for themselves. They've got a really nice pedigree. They've done several other games. I mean, uh, 13 Minutes, The Cuban Missile Crisis, I believe, is a fairly well-regarded game as well. But my experience with them, from Copenhagen and from uh, Tale of Pirates, I mean, Jen, I loved both of those games to pieces. And we thought that uh, Flamme Rouge was very good too. Just the subject matter didn't pull us in. So, these guys, I am there when they work together on a game. And they have delivered here as well. This is a phenomenal... Um Oh, I guess I'd have to say gateway. Probably not gateway class. Probably lower, you know, lower complexity, more family level. Wonderful push your luck game. And I think it is unavoidable to uh, stop oneself from drawing parallels between it and the big, big hit of the last few years, Quacks of Quenlinburg. Did Quacks get nominated or did it win? for the spiel. I don't remember. But anyway, uh, Quacks and Clemenberg is another recent Euro-y, um, bigger, richer, push-your-luck game. Push-your-luck games, traditionally in board gaming, are just 10, 15 little minute little things where you just get in, do some stuff, and you're done. Um, you know, just light little trifles. 
But Quedlinburg surprised everybody by making a fairly uh, uh, thought-provoking game because you're you're mixing in this bag-building thing where the stuff you're building, you're trying to get the stuff you really want, but pushing your luck. And will your uh, cauldron of potions that you're trying to brew explode? Um, and an incredible sense of escalation. You start out doing very little things. By the end of the game, you do really huge things. And um, yeah, and it was a huge hit. It's already had one expansion. And, and uh, what, good on it. Jen and I, we did have problems with it, though, because I felt there was like a fundamental flaw in the push-your-luck nature, because as the game goes on, there are such huge rewards, um, but, or no, I'm sorry, I'm going to say, huge penalties for busting, and you get very, very little, you get very little incentive to push your luck the longer that game goes. And that was our problem. We just found it always kind of petered out those last few rounds. Like, okay, I'm not going to take any risks, because I'm not going to risk... 15 points just to get two extra points. And that just happened over and over again. So it was a real... It started great, but always just kind of... Just limped across the finish line for us. It was okay. I know a lot of people love it. But anyway, that was my feeling about Quinlanburg. Deep Blue shows you how it's done. There is so much going on. Even though, broadly speaking, this is a lighter game. The uh, special... You don't put special powers in the bag. The special powers are your crew. And I gotta say right now, this is one of my favorite gameplay mechanisms I've seen this year. This notion. Because we've seen this a lot. Uh, you know, Concordia from Matt Gertz has really popularized the idea of, oh, I've got a handful of cards. And over time, I'll play more and more of the cards. And what order will I play them in? And eventually, ah, oh, I don't want to spend a whole turn, but I got it do it to get all the cards back and now I can get going again and I build up my hand and all that. This game, I love this idea of, oh yeah, I'll play the cards and I'll play the cards and I'll play the cards and okay, it's time to rest. Oh, I don't get all the cards back. I gotta shuffle up and I gotta hope what cards do I get back? Will I get back the um, the extra propellers I need to move? Will I get back that sea monster fighting uh, girl? I don't know. Ah, I didn't. The sea monster girl is still asleep in the bunk. Now, do I rest again to get her? It would be so wasteful to rest. I should play a couple more cards before I rest again so that I have a more efficient resting. Oh my gosh, this is brilliant. I love this idea. Like I said, it is one of the most clever hand management um, uh, mechanisms I've seen well, since Concordia. Uh, not that Concordia, you know, invented the notion of play a bunch of cards and then waste a turn and bring them all back. I mean, um, Lewis and Clark did it too, but this is like the freshest new evolution of that hand management, and I love it. I would love to see that in deeper, richer, heavier games too. And it's so important because this game is very quick. It is a race game um, where everybody is zipping along as fast as they can. You're going to find those uh, four uh, sites before too long, and then the game just ends. There's no, hey, everybody gets to finish the round and then one more round. Nope, you've got to be ready to end at any time. So every turn is, okay, I didn't, I didn't get what I needed. Do I have time to rest one more time, or do I act now? The game is full of that kind of tension, and it works great. Um, you know, and of course, you would expect that tension because hey, it's a push your luck game. Do I keep diving deeper and deeper? And it's palpable. It feels like you're going deeper. You can feel the pressure of you know the fathoms crushing you. Oh, do I draw one more? I gotta stop now. But here's the thing. I mentioned Quenlinburg earlier because. While I thought it was brilliant, there were so many cool things. It had that one fundamental flaw, to my taste anyway, that there you were not incentivized to keep pushing when you got to when you were getting to the point where there was so much to lose and so little to gain. In this game, there is always so much more considerations than just should I go and try to get two more points? Yeah, that's there. That's the nature of any push your luck game. Should I draw to get two or three more points, or should I stop and take what I got? But now you have these extra elements. You've got your crew. Should I stop now? If I draw one or two more, if I draw one more and just get one more silver, it's not worth the risk. But if I could get two more silver, then I could play this character that will give me extra points. Um, because all of your crew, or not all of your crew, if you rested and you were prepared, or, um, you know, you know um, and you've got the crew in play, you don't want to stop diving until you've used them. Because otherwise you wasted them and you're not peak efficiency. So you've got that extra element. That is brilliant right there. Plus, the bonuses you can get for scouting where, oh, for everybody else, silver's just worth one, but it's worth three for me. I've not seen any silver. You better believe I'm going to risk everything to keep diving to get that silver because it's getting me three points every turn and it gives everybody else only one. And that's the other brilliant thing too. You as often as not, are not alone when you are diving in this game. Chances are somebody is riding on your coattails um, because they saw you're diving. Oh, great. Oh, okay, I'll jump over there too. 
Yeehaw! Because hopefully I'll, I got a free movement out of it, if nothing else. And hopefully I'll get to play some of my cards during the dive as well. And this is so brilliant for a couple of reasons. One, if you are the player who piggybacked, and you're like, oh, I'm hoping to go and I'm hoping you keep diving because I want to play my cool expert cards and whatnot, you have you have ceded all control. You are completely helpless. You are 100% at the whim of your opponent, the dive master, and the dive master says, "We'll stop diving when I say we stop diving." And you better hope that you've got some protection because if you zipped in there, you don't have any protection. You didn't get any scouting bonuses, and um, if they've got those bonuses, and oh, boom, oh, we just ra ran out of oxygen. Ah, uh, we should keep going, shouldn't we? Yeah, no, please don't! I don't have any protection! I don't care, because I do. Um, that is so awesome. Uh, you know, getting back to when you're the dive leader, it's another incentive for you to keep going, to keep risking everything, because another element will happen is, depending on the circumstances, depending on who, what to, cr crew you have available to you, what scouting bonuses you have available to you, you just might want to keep diving to shake everybody else off your tail. You dare join my dive? How dare you? We are going to the bottom of the ocean here. I'm not stopping until you resurface. Um, we will all drown together rather than you getting um, you know, two-thirds of the points that I would get off of this. That is brilliant. It is so cool. And there's so much drama and um, excitement going on from both for the player who is the lead, the dive leader. Because, hey, hey, if we all drown, I know at least I get some points off of that. But I've got to worry, too. Yeah, I'll just keep going until you give up because I know you didn't get that bonus from O2. But do you have one in your hand? I don't know. And more importantly, do I keep going, which allows you to play your experts? Because the thing is, even if the whole thing is a bust, if you play your expert cards, you still get to score them. And so there is so much that goes in. It is such a rich decision. Every additional thing you pull. <gasps> oh, we're, get, we're running low on L2. Should I keep going? You better believe I'm going. And oh, more gold for me. Yay. Um, oh, I'm so over the moon with it. This... Like I said, Deep Blue, um, Daniel and Oscar, they have shown everybody how it's done. Um, um, push your luck doesn't have to be, oh, I just want more points. It, there can be so much more, so many more layers going on, and I love it. I am very impressed by this game. That said, I've got one complaint, and it's really a two-player complaint. Of course, Rado's going to complain about two-player stuff. Here's the thing. Now, this isn't going to be something that happens every game, but it's a big old board. And if you're playing with more players, because I think the game goes up to five, doesn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, up to five players. Chances are, wherever you are, there's going to be ample opportunity for you to jump into somebody else's dive. And that's so much of what makes this game special. When other people are riding on your coattails and you're going to drive them to the bottom of the sea. Um, but if you're playing a two-player game, there is no scaling at all. The ocean is just as big. And if somebody, and this is what we've discovered, propellers are everything. Because if somebody's got a lot of propellers, they've been able to recruit those, um, you know, those characters that uh, do two or three. Because at the beginning of the game, you've only got three propellers. And the thing is, if somebody's got a lot of propellers and you don't, and you rest and you don't get lucky and find those propellers, oh, I didn't get the propellers, great, I can do more recruiting, but that doesn't matter if you're on the other side of the world, and you're just doing dive after dive after dive, and I'm still stuck over here, and there's nobody else in the neighborhood for me to interact with. That can definitely happen in a two-player game, and I think it's a real shame. I wish it had been something along the lines of either, you know, your starting deck... We took out, we, everybody started with four propellers instead of three, just to ensure players are getting around a little bit faster so that you can't leave me in the dust through kind of a dumb luck combination of drafting. Because maybe all, maybe all the captains that go faster at the bottom of the deck and you got the only one, and now you're on the other side of the world and I'm still, okay, I'm still just trying to rest and get one propeller so I can even move one space. Um, and, uh, you know, so, and if not more propellers from the deck, I think a really brilliant thing would have been, hey, you know what, in a two player game, um, um, when a dive starts, any ship that is one space away can jump like always, but any ship that is two spaces away can jump if there's empty space between them. Because that's another interesting thing. As the game goes on, fewer and fewer dive spots are available. It's all just open ocean. And that's what I'm talking about. At the end of the game, having lots of propellers is everything to get where you need to go. Um, so, and, but again, there's only one other player out there, and if they've left you in the dust, it's... 
It's not going to be as much fun for either player because this game really sings when multiple people are invested in the dive. And I think it's a minor complaint. It might not even happen because if propeller economy gets kind of, um, you know, meted out equally, it's probably going to be okay. But if I just can't rest and get those propellers back, or if I can never get any propellers and you are fast, I, I'm not even saying you're going to win. Uh, because there are things I can do. I can, okay, I'll stand still. I'll just try to make do with what I can. You'll be doing really well. Hopefully I can uh, pull something out with my recruitments and I've got more people that can leverage stuff when I do get to do a dive. Um, you might still be able to win, but the problem is neither of us will be having as much fun because you are incentivized to get away from each other. Um, but... Uh, you know, in a, in a higher player count game, you just can't do it. In this game, in a two-player game, you can, and then it just feels a little bit less. And I think it would have been nice if that had been addressed in the design. But that's my only complaint, because otherwise, this is stellar. I would love, um, to, well, first of all, I would love to play this at higher player counts, and I would love to see more love from the guys. I mean, I would, uh, you know, the uh, the one thing that I miss from Quacks is the notion of special functional things in this bag. That would be really, really cool. Um, and really, you could do that now because right now, all the people you hire, all they do is to say, hey, you know what? When you uh, get silver or gold, you get extra points. There could definitely be crew members you hire that, oh, when you um, do two silver, you um, eliminate one of the blue tokens so you can dive longer. You know, there could be other things. And I would love to see that because the base game here is great. And at higher player counts, I think uh, it will give you tons of wonderful family gaming. But it's deceptively deep, this game. Sorry, um, <laughs> deep blue. Uh, because for gamers, there is so much more going on here than what you would see in your typical push your luck game. And... I gotta say, overall, I'm very, very impressed by the deep blue. And that's the run-through, folks. Thanks so much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Oh, bye bye